chapter 19. Um, this covers history taking, secondary assessment, and reassessment. So um, this will be the last chapter uh, in the assessment section uh, of the course. So um, a lot of this, again, is fairly repetitive to what you already know as an EMT, uh, but it's a good reinforcement because in many cases uh, we tend to leave out uh, much of the information we gain from EMT when we think we're going to an advanced level. So, um, as always, uh, to simply watch or listen to this lecture is no replacement to actually reading and studying the chapter, so if you haven't done that, please do so. The education standard is apply to scene information and patient assessment findings, scene size up primary and secondary assessment, patient history and reassessment to guide emergency management. Uh, we have a number of uh, objectives that are found on pages 478 and 479 in your text. Let's skip through those. So as an introduction, the AEMTs identify the patient's problems by taking medical histories and performing physical examinations. Um, they're, they're not exclusive of one another. We have to have both, both parts. We tend to emphasize uh, the exam in a trauma patient and tend to emphasize the history in the medical patient. But oh, it's important that we don't forget that there are clues on the physical exam of the medical patient. There is uh, clues in the history uh, of a patient with traumatic injury. So it's important not to leave one out. Uh, the secondary assessment allows us to gather additional information. So that primary assessment we were looking for uh, in treating any immediate life threats. And now as we move to the secondary assessment, we'll, we'll look for the things that are uh, less likely to be life-threatening. Uh, and then uh, occasionally we do find things in the secondary assessment that um, kind of raise our suspicion a little bit, but uh, right off the bat, in many cases, they're not immediately life-threatening, but they could be potentially life-threatening. So all patients receive some sort of a secondary assessment, although it may be very limited, say, in the cases of a cardiac arrest patient. We may not get very far out of the primary assessment, but we are still going to try to look over the patient real quickly, do a quick survey of them, uh, and then probably ask a few questions regarding uh, medical problems, medical history, so on and so forth. The approach, the timing, and the level of detail differ. So as you know, I just mentioned, the cardiac arrest patient, we really do a very abbreviated secondary assessment. So the secondary assessment depend, depends on a few things. The medical problem or the traumatic injury. We have an, you know, an unresponsive, uh, head trauma patient versus a responsive patient with um, low blood sugar. Uh, we're going to definitely approach that at a different different angle. Um, we're not going to spend nearly as much time uh, on history uh, and a very very detailed exam on say a trauma uh, trauma patient until we have a little bit more resources available. Also, their chief complaint. So their chief complaint helps us to determine, particularly in the medical patient, what areas are we going to go do an exam on? Where are we going to look? So the patient who's complaining of shortness of breath, you know, you can't see shortness of breath anywhere else on the patient's body besides, you know, really their head and chest. Um, and that's, you're not even really seeing it there. You're kind of getting hints and clues. <laughs> However, there are some other things that go along with shortness of breath. So let's say congestive heart failure, in which we would then drive us to go, hmm, well, with patients who are short of breath and have wet lung sounds, they may have swelling in the ankles. So we go and look for swelling in the ankles. They may have distension of their abdomen, so we would check that. They may have jugular venous distension, so we would go and check in that area. So um, we may also look at something like a patient who's complaining of a ripping style or a, a, a pain that they describe as a tear or a rip um, in, uh, in their chest. Well, we're going to definitely check peripheral pulses, uh, patients with, a, with aortic aneurysm sometimes will have pulse deficits uh, further down the line. Say they may have very good radial pulses, they may have even unequal radial pulses from one side to the other, yet no, um, no pedal pulses. Are they critical or are they non-critical? And the resources we have to put forth towards those. And then any of those circumstances at the scene, trauma patients, 
critical trauma patients get loaded and they get scooting down the road quickly. So it depends on how much time we have before we get pulling into the hospital. We may we may not have much time to do the full, complete, detailed, inch by inch, head to toe. So our secondary assessment can include rapid trauma or rapid medical assessment or exam uh, that focuses on doing uh, a, a real quick head to toe in which we're going to uh, just kind of look for anything that jumps off the page at us. Uh, it, it's not extremely in depth. We're going to be obtaining vital signs. We're going to use any appropriate monitoring devices, so pulse oximetry, glucometry, cardiac uh, monitors as, as appropriate. Um, doing a focused head to toe physical exam when we can and of course obtaining that patient history. So it also includes things such as therapeutic communication. If we're not able to get our message across to our patient, we are not going to get the answers to the questions and the history that we're needing. So if we ask them, um, do you have any pertinent past medical history? Uh, that's a confusing statement. We all know what that means, but it's a confusing statement to lay people. Or um, do, you, uh, do you have a history of hypertension, um, diabetes mellitus, do you have any history of a uh, myocardial infarction? You know, using that medical lingo puts up roadblocks, so we don't we don't get the full um, picture from the patient because the patient didn't understand what we were looking for to begin with. We need to know our anatomy and physiology. We need to know our pathophysiology. Knowing those things helps us to uh, put the signs and symptoms together. Uh, put together the, the findings from the physical exam as well as the history and say, okay, this starts to make a little bit of sense now. We also have to have clinical reasoning skills, you know, something that, that is kind of a new concept in, in reality to a lot of us is we haven't done a lot of clinical reasoning up to this point. We were very cookbook driven. So the history uh, is a present illness and the past medical history. So we're actually looking at two things. And when we say history, in most cases, people immediately think of past medical history, which is, uh, we use that mnemonic sample uh, for that. But we also have other things that we want to do, such as OPQRST, which is really geared more towards the history of the present illness, or the HPI. So we have PMH, which is past medical history, and HPI, which is the history of the present illness. Um, they're not really a true under, uh, a true substitute for understanding the information that is important. There's a lot of the stuff that gets left out when we simply use sample and uh, OPQRST. Uh, it, those are they're intended to be a guide. They're intended to be a jumping off point. So if we ask somebody, for example, are you allergic to anything? Well, they may only think about medication. They may not think about food. They may not think about herbal. They may not think about environment. Do you take any medications? They may not think herbal. They may not think holistic remedies. They may not think illicit drugs. So, and, and those things don't, uh, don't get built into the sample. We try to remind you that those things need to be there. Uh, but, you know, if you simply do SAMPLE, uh, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't always translate. History of the present illness. So we're asking so for onset, provocation, palliation, um, quality, radiation, severity, time. Well, that doesn't always give us information. Let's say uh, we have a pregnant lady. When was your last menstrual period? That doesn't fit in there. Okay. How many times have you uh, been pregnant? How many times have you given live birth? How many uh, lost pregnancies have you had? Uh, those things aren't there. So we have to know as we go through the different medical emergencies, which we start in the next chapter with, radi uh, with respiratory emergencies, uh, as we start going through these, we have to start connecting the dots here and connecting those pieces that will help us do a better job of assessing our patients. So your think about it again goes back to your uh, case study in the text. General approaches to taking a secondary assessment and a history. Uh, form an initial impression uh, of the nature of illness or the mechanism of injury on your 
patient, whether they're critical or non-critical. So we get that initial impression or that general impression in which we kind of say, all right, from a gut feeling, from the doorway, from my very first contact with this patient, here's what I'm thinking. Critical and non-critical, medical, non, uh, medical or trauma, um, alert and oriented or unconscious. So we take those bits and pieces of information and then that drives us in the approach we're going to take to our secondary. The goal is to transport critical patients sooner and we're also going to try to be calm and organized to prevent undue delays at the scene. We've probably all been on calls in which we've had unnecessary delays on the scene. Whether it was somebody there who was an incompetent twit who couldn't appropriately uh, do an assessment, couldn't appropriately do a skill, or uh, even worse, somebody who was bound and determined that they were going to get something done before you transported this patient, um, and they never were able to get it done appropriately. So those sorts of things come up, and our goal in some of these uh, history and assessment techniques uh, is to avoid a lot of these. A complete secondary assessment of a critical patient is often deferred until en route to the hospital or once they, they arrive at the hospital. I mean, again, we would love to have full, complete head to toes and four or five sets of vital signs on everybody. And, you know, we would love to have the whole picture. It's just not always possible. It depends on our crew configuration. If there's two of you, and in a lot of, uh, a lot of settings these days it is, it's two people show up to go on an ambulance call. Uh, you may not have the hands to do the full head to toe. You may be busy bagging the patient. So uh, it, a lot of it depends. You know, again, what is your transport time? Do you live in the community where your closest hospital is? You may have a five minute at best transport time. Or you may work in a county wide service in which you're talking about it's a 15 or 20 minute transport. Or you live in a community that doesn't have a hospital. So, you know, a lot, there's a lot of what ifs, and we have to know what our settings are. The rapid secondary assessment is performed uh, as the patient is prepared for transport. So again, that's a lot of times that quick head to toe, go, doing a, a once over to say, hey, is there anything else major or pressing that we need to be aware of um, before we move this patient and put them uh, you know, on the road? And again, many tasks of patient assessment are performed simultaneously, depending on the number of people who show up. If we're lucky enough to have three or four or six people show up on an ambulance call, uh, things tend to be done a little bit more efficiently. Now, whether or not they're done correctly, that that's a whole other issue. depends on who our partners are. We, we all know of people on our service that we absolutely positively don't want coming to pick us up. Um, that's just the way it is. Um, but if we have competent people and somebody can competently get vital signs, somebody's managing airway, somebody's getting a backboard, or, or somebody's being a gopher, and somebody's doing a history, and somebody's doing a physical exam, we can throw these parts together um, and usually whoever's the person in charge is the one that kind of takes and, and, can, and uh, accumulates these and puts them all together and then tries to come up with uh, an idea of what's going on. So on our medical patients that are non-critical, these are people who have no threats to their ABCs, they're responsive, they don't have a chief complaint that indicates an immediate life-threatening condition. So you know, in, in, in a lot of cases that would be somebody who was complaining of chest pain, severe chest pain, uh, shortness of breath, those are kind of critical things. Um, whereas somebody with some mild abdominal pain or I have leg pain, um, you know, itching, those sorts of things tend to be le obviously less life-threatening. So, um, yet these are patients who are probably going to need, need to be evaluated and treated in a hospital, uh, and the conditions uh, are not as time-sensitive as critical patients. <laughs> so, when we're talking about these non-critical patients, some kind of general guidelines there. Additionally, we're going to look at things like getting a field impression. We're going to base our history off of their chief complaint. So if their chief complaint was um, you know, swelling, swelling in the ankles, um, 
uh, if we're talking about something like swelling in the ankles, it might be, oh, well, that could be injuries. Uh, it could be uh, gout. It could be, um, you know, renal failure. Uh, could be hypertension, congestive heart failure. So it kind of drives us. Uh, we're going to obtain vital signs, of course, and then do that secondary uh, exam. We we're going to start to revise our general impression. So maybe our, our gut instinct initially said we need to move along, and then we get more information. We say, oh, well, maybe not so much. And then start to get our field impression of what is going on with this patient. You maybe don't exactly know. You maybe can't exactly diagnose this person. But uh, your general impression is, is subject to revision. Doctor, doctors will revise their um, diagnoses on a very regular basis. You look at whether they're a priority or non-priority transport. You implement the appropriate treatments, and then you reassess every 15 minutes at a minimum. If we have the critical medical patient, so effective assessment and management can't take place without teamwork. We're not going to get this person moved down the road if it's a one-man show. Um, you need to be calm and deliberate. Even though you may not be completely comfortable with what's going on, calm and deliberate um, because patient, you know, like dogs, the patients can sense fear. You know, they can they can tell when something's wrong. Um, so if we're being calm, uh, we're being supportive. We're going to collect any key information from their sample history as well as their OPQRST as necessary. Obtain baseline vital signs. Use any monitoring devices. Perform any physical exam necessary. If the problem isn't clear, then we perform a quick medical exam, which we kind of scan the whole body. Uh, we're not going to delay transport by performing uh, tasks on scene that can be performed in route. So maybe we're, we're going to choose to start with our cardiac arrest patient and do an, an oral airway and a bag valve mask with some O2, um, our AED sequence, get them loaded up and on our way down the road, and then we might decide, okay, well, let's put an IV in or let's put a King airway in, uh, something else that, that kind of steps things up a little bit. But we got them going on a... On a um, quick basis. And then analyze decisions throughout the call. That actually goes with everything. You know, we kind of look at um, you know, what have we done, what could we do different, what, what questions still remain. So if you're looking here at uh, these last couple of slides, there's a graphic re representation of the critical versus the non-critical uh, medical patient on page 482 and 43 in your text. So they have this assessment. So it kind of gives you the idea of what you're, what you're gunning for and what, what we're trying to get accomplished here. Um, although it's, uh, it's very general. I think most of us are, are fairly familiar with a lot of these steps and we're going to spend a lot more time studying these steps as we have more skills days and whatnot. So our trauma patient that is non-critical and we have the same sort of thing, critical versus non-critical trauma patient, graphic representations on 484. So we have non-life-threatening, non-limb-threatening, isolated injuries, broken ankle, broken forearm, something along those lines. Uh, does not have mechanisms of injury to produce life or limb-threatening injuries. Um, we have a focused physical exam we're going to perform, in which we're going to um, <clears throat> base it off of what we're told information we were given, um, baseline vital signs, a sample history, OPQRST certainly applies here as well, and then manage those isolated injuries and in transport. So maybe it's a, a leg injury or an arm injury, something like that. We may include some splinting, maybe some uh, cold packs to help reduce swelling. Maybe we even consider giving them a little bit of uh, nitrous oxide to help control some of their pain. In a critical trauma patient, so we have a patient who has a serious mechanism of injury, probably has some sort of a problem with their airway breathing circulation or their mental status, uh, which helps us drive and say, okay, this is a serious patient. 
So time is going to be of the essence. Uh, we need to stabilize the immediate life threats that we found in the primary assessment immobilize the spine as indicated and in most critical patients, most critical trauma patients, as of this point in time, we are going to immobilize because the mechanism of injury usually is significant um, or uh, you know we have that unresponsive trauma patient that we just don't know. And the current standard of care is to immobilize. Um, that's not to say it's going to be that way forever and we're, in fact we, we're pretty confident that it won't be. But, and then uh, prepare for transport to an appropriate facility. I'm going to take a moment and, and uh, touch on that for just another, uh, uh, take it to another spin here. Um, transporting to the appropriate facility. This is even coming up more in the medical arenas now. So because there are certain hospitals that are specialized in cardiac care or stroke care, um, the two major ones. Um, burn care, which is actually trauma, but um, not all trauma centers are burn centers. Uh, we may have uh, specialty hospitals that take care of uh, pregnant ladies in, in uh, pediatrics. So taking the time to know your community and know your system and know, okay, where truly is the best place to take this person? Yes, most of the patients we deal with in EMS are appropriate to take to the closest emergency room. But there are those minority that have a true medical need, uh, whether they're having a possible stroke, possible heart attack, a woman in labor, um, a pediatric patient, that sometimes bypassing the closest emergency room and going to a specialized emergency room or a specialized facility um, is the much better choice. It's a much, much better option for our patients in the long run. And, and people will argue, they're like, well, we just want to get them to the closest hospital, get them stabilized, and then they can transfer. There's, in many cases, doing that, once a patient sets foot in a different, in an emergency room, it sets off a chain of events that is not easy to quickly break and get out of. So once a patient, say, shows up at hospital A, they have to be evaluated by a physician or a mid-level provider in that facility. And there has to be X, Y, and Z arrangements made. It's not like they show up at the hospital and 30 seconds later another ambulance picks them up and whisks them off to the next hospital. That doesn't happen. Okay, so if we're talking somebody who has a, um, a probable stroke where we're, or, or a STEMI, a heart attack, you know, we're, we're very limited on the number of hours we have to effectively treat these things. So by planting them in a small emergency room, uh, you're going to eat up the better part of an hour before that person is even transported. So it behooves the patient to go to the right place the first time. I know people need to get back to work. I know people don't want to be out on a call at 3 o'clock in the morning. That's the nature of the, of the business. It's the nature of the beast we got to transport patients to appropriate facilities, not just closest because it's convenient. And that I, I will tell you that that is the biggest lie that people are telling is, oh, it's not just because it's convenient, it's because we really want them to go to the closest and stabilize. That's a crock of crap. I can tell you that the majority of them, with a lot of the services around the metro area, they're dropping them off at the closest emergency room because it's convenient. Critical trauma patients perform a rapid trauma exam. So a systematic, quick head to toe. This is not inch by inch. This is just a quick head to toe. We're looking at each specific area, making sure there's nothing that's outstanding, nothing that's jumping off the page at us, and then moving on. We're looking for the signs of significant injury. So open wounds, bruises, deformities that are obvious. Yes, DCAT BTLS does come into play here. It would be great for us to uh, be able to identify all those things, but a majority of the DCAT BTLS actually gets pawned off on a more detailed trauma assessment after this. Because this is, remember, we're doing a, we're doing a hurry up job to get them headed down the road to the correct place. Um, and so uh, it's not as, as in, in detail. The link between the primary and secondary assessment used the mnemonic ABCDE. 
So we know the A, B, C, D of the primary assessment. We add E, which is expose and examine. So the E is exposed and examined. So uh, if you have an unresponsive or a critical trauma patient, you can't find it, you can't treat it if you can't see it. So that's where sometimes the make them naked thing comes into place. Uh, and we get a little scissor happy. Just remember, use common sense, cover them back up, um, and uh, you know respect their dignity. So pres respect their, or preserve their privacy. Prevent hypothermia. Trauma patients is a big deal. Their body's already under fire um, because if they're potentially in the shock, starting into shock, their body is using up resources very quickly and not doing a good job of maintaining its own body heat. So hypothermia is a potential uh, issue. Uh, obtaining those baseline vital signs, measure the SpO2, whatever other um, you know, devices you may be using. So here's a, a chart. Uh, that you'll actually find on 485 in your text that uh, is a general approach uh, or a, uh, a critical criteria for the trauma patients. Uh, this is a probably a pretty good chart to have uh, committed to memory. Um, I think we've seen most of these before, so it really shouldn't be uh, earth-shattering. So complete or partial ejection in a motor vehicle collision. Motor vehicle collision that causes the death of another occupant in the same vehicle. Rollover mechanism high-speed motor vehicle collision, intrusion or damage of greater than 12 inches into the passenger compartment or 18 inches at any point on the vehicle, pedestrian and or bicycle uh, struck by a motor vehicle, motorcycle collision greater than 20 miles an hour, fall from a height greater than 20 feet for an adult or three times their own height of a child, um, blast or explosion trauma, penetrating trauma except distal to the elbow or the knee, amputation or near amputation proximal to the fingers or toes, and then traumas with burns. Some common characteristics you see for these patients is their, their obstructed or inadequate or threatened airway, blood, teeth, whatever, vomit. They have impaired ventilation, chest wall, um, diaphragm rupture, so on. Uh, they have a significant hemorrhage, uh, external or suspected internal, uh, altered mental status and or neurologic deficit, the presence of serious other medical conditions such as they take medications uh, as anticoagulants, they have a bleeding disorder, heart problem, lung problem, they're older than 55 years of age, they have hypothermia or they're pregnant. So some general characteristics. These, these are people that are uh, probably need to be headed toward the trauma center. So your field impression. <clears throat> your field impression through your clinical reasoning process is going to help you try to confirm or maybe unconfirm or or uh, rule out your, your earlier hypotheses. So you may have said, oh, here's what I'm pretty sure is going on. Well, we got called to our diabetic reaction, and you know we go to this person's house five times a month for a diabetic reaction. We got called for altered mental status, so we're probably going for a diabetic reaction. And we get there, and everything starts to point towards diabetic reaction. And then we find out, oh, well, the patient got put on a new medication um, because number one, she has a lot of uh, chronic pain, and uh, two, uh, she's got some new onset uh, renal failure, um, and she's unable to get rid of. All this medication correctly and now her altered mental status has been going on for 36 hours now uh, because she got this new pain medication and her body can't eliminate it. So oh maybe it's not a diabetic reaction. We check her blood sugar and it's normal. So we have to sometimes revise. It is not a definitive diagnosis of the patient's problem. In most cases the definitive diagnosis um, may not even be done in the emergency room. Uh, that patient might have some preliminary diagnoses that get admitted to the, to the floor, the ICU, or where have you. Um, and it's not until further evaluation is done that a definitive permanent diagnosis is given. This field impression also provides a basis for the management decisions. So if we don't come up with a field impression, how do we know that we need to give this person an IV? How do we know that this person needs oxygen? How do we know that this person needs D50, Narcan, or whatever? Um, you have to kind of 
draw some conclusion there, and your conclusion is your field impression uh, that gives you the basis to operate off of a protocol. So some questions that will help guide you in the patient assessment process, also found on 485 in your text. Uh, is it safe to approach the patient and begin care in the patient's current location? If not, what must we do to solve this problem? Really, that's the overwhelming major question that we ask in the uh, scene size up, which is, is it safe for us to be here? Is it safe for our patient? What is the nature of the patient's problem? Don't confuse that with what is the nature of the illness, because it actually means is this an illness or is this an injury? So again, an initial uh, scene size up question. How sick is the patient? That's kind of that transition from scene size up to from scene size up to uh, primary assessment. It's that initial gut instinct. What interventions, resources, or actions are going to be required immediately? When we get there, we take a look at the patient. They're unresponsive. Uh, they're doing guppy breathing. They're ashen gray in color. They're not moving. Well, we're probably going to need to invest at least a few resources. Airway management, maybe ventilation and O2, and who knows? We may even need to be pushing on the chest and doing defibrillators. Or there's blood spraying all over the place. Well, we're going to have to control some bleeding. Which healthcare facility can best meet the patient's immediate needs? If you're in, uh, you know, the majority of the situations in rural Iowa and rural Nebraska, you have one hospital to pick from. Um, there's a, a few places that may be lucky to have two hospitals nearby. Um, you know, it, it would certainly seem you know, unofficially that a, a majority of the hospitals outside of the larger cities um, in Iowa and Nebraska are a minimum of 20 to 30 miles apart. In fact, depending on uh, on your exact location, and I'll give you an example of, of out in the panhandle of Nebraska, um, you could potentially drive th straight through seven counties without hitting a hospital. Or you may have a two and a half hour transport time because that's the closest hospital. So there's, there's a lot of potential uh, questions that have to be asked about your local system. If you have the opportunity, you're closer to a larger city where there's multiple options, perfect, great, that's what we're what we need. We need to uh, make those appropriate transport decisions. How should the patient be transported to receive this care? Are we going to go by ground? Are we going to go by air? All kind of depends on the situation. You know, if you have to wait an extra 20 minutes for a helicopter to get there before the patient transport begins, you very well possibly can be there before the helicopter even gets halfway back. So, um, what do you need to support the patient's vital functions from the time you arrive at the scene to the time uh, you can transfer care of the patient uh, to the hospital personnel? So it kind of goes back to interventions again, as well as do we need additional resources like ALS, uh, paramedics? So is the patient's condition stable, improving, or worsening? Oh, crap. I'll fix that here. All right, and finally, our reassessment. So when we're tracking the changes of the patient's condition, uh, we're going to evaluate the effects of the treatment. Are things getting better? Are things getting worse? Uh, if we started the patient, uh, the example they give in the book, I think, I think is is just spot on. Picture a patient whose initial SpO2 before O2 administration was 92%. Patient was mildly hypoxic. You opted to give four liters a minute by nasal cannula. Five minutes later, the patient's SpO2 is now 94%. Uh, the patient's SpO2 has improved, but the goal is to reach 95 or higher depends on, on the protocol. So you may have to say, well, do we need to give a breathing treatment? Do we need to change to a simple mask, a Venturi mask, a, a trach mask, a um, non-rebreather? Do we need to ventilate the patient? That's your reassessment. Maybe you started the patient on an IV. 
and uh, you wanted to, to make sure not give them lots of fluid because you think they have congestive heart failure. But you opened up your IV wide to make sure it was patent and running well after you started it with the intentions of turning it way back down to TKO, but you got sidetracked and you forgot. And so you ran in a bunch of fluid. Your reassessment's telling you, hey, every five, every 15 minutes, go back and look at all these things and make sure they're still going how we want them to. Do we need to improve it? Do we need to change it? Maybe uh, we put some dressings on a wound and now they're starting to bleed through. Um, the, and so we need to do something different. We need to do a better job of controlling that bleeding. Maybe we need to put more dressings on. Maybe we need to do a tourniquet. So again, our 5 and 15, this has not changed. Critical patients receive a reassessment every 5 minutes, non-critical every 15, at least. You can go, you can go less than that if you want. So uh, a reassessment includes monitoring devices, physical exam, you know, the, the, the highlights of the physical exam findings. It doesn't have to be a complete head to toe. The primary assessment, vital signs, all those sorts of things. Um, and that type of secondary assessment uh, that we perform. So whether it's a quick one or, um, you know, we're really looking at to make sure that we don't have significant, significant changes. Sometimes the patient ends up with a different complaint. So they might be telling us, um, well, uh, you know, I don't have chest pain anymore, but I have a headache now. After you gave me that nitroglycerin, I now have a headache, but my chest pain's gone. Well, through the process of, of uh, critical thinking and, and using uh, clinical judgment, we can say, hey, it's very common for chest pain patients who receive nitroglycerin to complain of headache. So it, it's, an ad, you know, it's an adverse effect, although probably not, not a, a life-threatening one. Uh, so sometimes we find these new things. Sometimes it gets worse, sometimes it gets better. Uh, you know, my, my pain was, a, was an 8 out of 10, and now it's a 2 out of 10. If the patient has a significant change in between assessments, we should probably do a reassessment right at that point. So a patient goes from responsive to unresponsive. Well, they were responsive and stable before, so you know we don't have to do an assessment for 15 minutes. But now all of a sudden they become unresponsive. Uh, we're going to start over. Okay, we're we're going to start with a new assessment and then restart the clock because now the patient's unresponsive. They're unstable. We need to um, to move along with this because the patient could get uh, real bad. So documentation, you're going to organize your assessment findings, you're going to document these in your patient care report, and then what information needs to be documented in the, in the patient care report? Everything. Everything needs to be documented in the patient care report, including things like pertinent negatives. So we're going to document things like positive findings. So if we say uh, the patient has uh, a complaint of shortness of breath, um, but we may also say, but the patient doesn't have any swelling in the ankles. They don't have any JVD. They don't have abdominal swelling. Uh, that uh, makes us think of edema. So uh, pertinent findings that are both positive and negative. So if something isn't there that you expect it to be there, make sure and document that. That hey, we we document we we look to see if it happened if it was going on and it wasn't there. So it helps back you up. And then get feedback. Uh, on your documentation from your medical director and other EMS providers. So talking to people will help you be a better uh, better documenter or charter. Um, it, it's an art. It truly is an art. Uh, you, you've got to learn. You've got to be receptive to listening to uh, uh, other people give you some, some critiques on your, your work. So what are some patient conditions and situations? that should be considered when deciding how to approach a secondary assessment. Now, like we mentioned earlier, trauma versus medical, stable versus unstable, or critical versus uncritical, uh, alert versus unresponsive, mechanisms of injury versus natures of illness. So kind of that whole gut feeling, general impression stuff. So to take a medical history, 
there's a number of things that we obviously want to gather through that. Many of these, again, are things that we have seen all along since we became EMTs. But as we're doing a medical history, we're doing a couple of things, actually. We're establishing a rapport with a patient, so we're trying to open up, get the patient to open up a little bit to us and uh, trying to, uh, to get them to trust us. Remember to respect their privacy. It's not something we need to be shouting, something we need to be um, you know, broadcasting to everybody. Um, overcome the special challenges in communication. Maybe we have a person who doesn't primarily speak English, or we have somebody who doesn't, uh, who can't uh, hear, and we have to use written communication or an interpreter. And then principles and techniques of interviewing and therapeutic communication. We've talked about those um, way back in the beginning of the course. Uh, in the first couple of weeks, we talked about some therapeutic communication. So we've got to remember we get to we have to actually have contact with our patient. And when I say that, you are in, the, in a field um, that is an up-close, touchy personal, touchy-feely personal field. So that means you have to talk to your patients, you have to put your hands on your patients. Well, some of the biggest things we hear, particularly when our students go out to do internship, is they didn't want to talk to the patient, they didn't want to touch the patient. Well, if you're not going to touch or talk to the patient, you're not going to get the info you need, and you're going to be unsuccessful. So our sample history again. We have S, which is signs and symptoms. They list simply as symptoms, but remember, signs are things that you can see. Symptoms are things that the patient tells you. So signs and symptoms. Allergies. Allergies includes medications. It includes... Uh, foods, environmental allergies, medications. Medications includes not only prescription things, but over-the-counter things, herbal, holistic, illicit, or illegal, um, past medical history. And usually we throw a pertinent past medical history in there. Uh, we don't have to have the entire story. We have to have the entire story related to the appropriate areas that are going on here. Now, there are, there's a handful of things that we always want to know, whether or not they have heart problems, lung problems, diabetes, stroke problems. You know, there's, a, there's a handful of those things that we, we really need. Uh, but you know, to know that Mrs. Johnson had her appendix out in 1919, you know, and now she's complaining of ankle pain, uh, not terribly pertinent to what we have going on here. Last oral intake. Uh, this is particularly important in a few situations such as diabetic reactions, allergic reactions, people who are probably going to go to surgery. Uh, but last oral intake, when and what? And then events leading up to the problem. Have them explain to us what happened and why are we here? <clears throat> so symptoms. Start through the sample history. Symptoms. Uh, these are subjective complaints perceived uh, uh, by the patient. And they are generally elicited by asking open-ended questions. So when we're asking the patient, well, how do you feel? Do you have any complaints? Was there what seems to be bothering you? Those sorts of, of questions leave it open for them to give us this information. Now we may have to do some follow-up. We may have to say, okay, well you're telling me you have some chest discomfort. How about anything else that's bothering you? They may not get it. You may have to then go away from open-ended to close-ended questions. Say, how about shortness of breath? How about nausea or vomiting? Do you have the chills? Um, do you have um, any complaints of swelling? So those are things that we may have to then kind of badger them about. We also have some pertinent negatives. I brought this up before. So the patient with um, maybe chest discomfort. We may ask them, do you have any shortness of breath? No. Do you have any nausea or vomiting? No. Do you feel anxious? No. I just simply have this discomfort. Okay, those are pertinent negatives. You know, when you put the textbook picture of the heart attack patient, the, the acute coronary syndrome, the AMI patient together, it's 
they have chest pain, they have shortness of breath, the chest pain also radiates, and they have nausea, vomiting, they may be sweating, uh, they have a sense of impending doom or anxiety, uh, and la di da 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 So we have kind of cardinal, cardinal rules, and as we learn signs and symptoms of various different medical problems, those become our pertinent negatives if the patient doesn't have those. Okay. Does the symptom typically, uh, or does not have a symptom typically associated with the chief complaint, just as I, I demonstrated there. Uh, the history of the present illness then elaborates on that patient's symptoms. So when we start to dive then into the OPQRST, a lot of those things we're going to follow up uh, when they tell us I have this problem. Okay, the, the most classic one that goes with this OPQRST is pain. So with pain, there is an onset. When did it come on? Um, what were you doing when it came on? The P, we have palliation and provocation. What makes it better? What makes it worse? Quality. You know, describe it. Is it burning? Is it sharp? Is it dull? Is it pressure? Radiation. Does it go anywhere? Does it go into your arm, into your neck, into your back? Severity. How bad is it? Usually using a, a 0 to 10 or 1 to 10 scale. And then time, the duration of the symptoms. How long has this been going on? Have you had this before? Had it in the past? Um, now, some of those things aren't applicable. Do you have radiation of your shortness of breath? Uh, you don't get short of breath anywhere besides your chest. You don't get shortness of breath in your leg. So some of these have become non-applicable. But others will remain applicable um, with just about any complaint, such as severity or subjective quality those sorts of things, um, you certainly can, can get more information. So pain is a symptom. It's a very frequent complaint. It may also be discomfort. Sometimes discomfort is a better way to describe it simply for the fact that some people won't use pain unless it's really severe. You know, uh, you know, they may not consider uh, an aching chest to be chest pain. But do you have any discomfort? Well, then that that's a little more broad, a little more open for people to then interpret. So <clears throat> referred pain. Referred pain is kind of an interesting situation. But if patients have referred pain, they have uh, pain in an area that not the actual site of the problem. The number one example of this is people with gallbladder issues. People who have uh, cholecystitis, uh, which is a a gallbladder attack and inflammation of the gallbladder. People with cholecystitis, uh, with your gallbladder of course being in your right upper quadrant of your abdomen, tucked up inside the liver, the most common site of referred pain uh, for the gallbladder is up into your right shoulder. Well, that's quite a ways away from your right upper quadrant, but um, it follows a nerve track. And then pain is usually assessed using a scale of either 1 to 10 or 0 to 10. Some people choose to use 0 because technically if you, I guess if you're complaining of pain, you have at least a 1. Um, but if you had a, you know, if you had to describe your pain as being 0 to 10, you could certainly also get in there if they had no pain. Although you wouldn't typically ask them if they didn't at least have some sort of complaint of pain. Sometimes that scale is difficult to use as well. There will be patients you run into that don't get what you're going for here. And so sometimes I shorten it up. Now, probably everybody's seen the Wong-Baker Faces Scale. Uh, the Wong-Baker Faces Scale, that's the, the crying face that goes all the way up to the big smiley face. You know, and there's variations in between that uh, often gets used with kids. Uh, with uh, adults that don't quite understand the 1 to 10 scale, I sometimes will shorten it up to, do you have a little bit of pain, moderate pain, or severe pain? And then you know, try to extrapolate a number from that. So, um, because not everybody gets what we're asking. So we kind of have some descriptions of our pain. Um, have the patient give us a little bit more of a quality uh, of their pain. Um, we may be talking, this is on 487, uh, we may be talking about visceral pain versus somatic pain versus neuropathic, neuropathic, neuropathic pain, colicky pain, 
referred pain, radiating pain, or throbbing pain. Typically, the first two are the, the most common descriptions of pain that we'll get. Uh, would be visceral pain versus somatic pain. Visceral is a pain arising from the organs or your viscera. Um, usually is very vague and diffuse or be referred to as a dull pain. As opposed to somatic pain, this is pain arising from the inflammation of a lining of a body cavity, such as the peritoneum. It's usually very well located, it's intent, and it is tender to palpation, may be described as sharp pain. So usually if you say, show me where your pain is, show me exactly where your pain is, if they kind of take their hand and say, move it all around over their abdomen, that's a vis visceral pain. But they point right at their a very specific spot in their right lower quadrant uh, towards the groin. Um, that is a somatic pain. Uh, that's a pinpoint pain. They can can very um, they can very uh, uh, precisely point out where it's at. Um, neuropathic pain, on the other hand, this is a pain arising from the nerves, such as something like sciatica. So it's described usually as a shooting or a stinging pain, maybe a burning pain, and it may have associated paresthesias with it, paresthesia being numbness and tingling. So uh, if you've ever had a pinched nerve somewhere, you probably had a neuropathic pain. You can also have a colicky pain or colic. Uh, this arises from a spasm of the hollow organs, uh, uh, such as the intestines or the ureters. It tends to occur in waves. You kind of feel it move across or, or move along. Um, as you, your digestive process continues. You could have a referred pain. It's a pain felt in another part of the body. Um, for example, 